It's Comics Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, AADL.org, on the corner of 5th and William in lovely downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, the show is streamed live every week at comicsagreat.tv, and then it's collected as a podcast afterwards at uh, comicsagreat.com. And my name is Jersey Drost, cartoonist and teaching artist, and I've got some really, really awesome people with me today because we're going to talk about um, character design and a whole bunch of other things. But first, I got to turn to my Skype guest, introduce the New York Times best-selling illustrator, Mr. Jake Parker, agent44.com. Hello. Good to have you back, Jake. This is like your third time on the show, I think? Third time, yeah. Second time visually. That's right. That's right. Yeah. First time was just audio. Oh, yep. back in the old days before we had the video stream. Uh, uh, and there it is, The Astonishing Secret of Awesome Man, which made it onto the bestseller list, yeah? Yeah. But don't take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought in like a, like a 10 year old kid to talk about how good the book is. Yeah. <laughs> like his nose all stuffed up. <laughs> awesome Man was uh, my favorite book because I like the punching and the heart. <laughs> the heart. <laughs> Looking at the end. Um, I was just at uh, a convention two weeks ago, and I ran into Ramona Fraden, the artist who worked on Aquaman and a bunch of like you know Silver Age comics. Yeah. Uh, sweetest lady in the whole world has the personality of June Cleaver, but she likes to draw monsters. I mean, I I, I, I was ready to get down on my knee and beg her to be my mom. You know, I was like, <laughs> why couldn't you be my mom? <laughs> you, you can you can make cookies, and then we can talk about you know dinosaurs. Uh, but she had a book. She has a new book out, uh, and it's called uh, the Dinosaur That Got Tired of Being Extinct, and it's about a dinosaur that like bones in a museum that comes back to life and goes on an adventure. And at the back of the book, she had like what the critics are saying, and it's like a bunch of blurbs by like seven and eight-year-old kids. <laughs> I thought, what a great idea. That's awesome. That's yeah, as that's sincere good, as it gets. That's a good idea. But anyway, so, uh, how you know, awesome, man. Made it onto the bestseller list. Best yeah. list. Congratulations, man. Yeah. Yeah, I think it had more to do with the author than my illustrations, but... Uh... Oh, I'm sure that it... <laughs> If the illustrations were garbage, I think that that would work against whatever author it was, right? Yeah, but it, you know, it's, it was cool. I remember getting the the email from my publisher saying, "Hey, check it out." And uh, yeah, it was it was nice. Called my wife immediately, and I uh, said, "You will now address me as New York Times bestselling illustrator Jake." <laughs> She said, shut up and do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Remember, Caesar, thou art mortal. Absolutely. That's, that's what a spouse is for. Um, so, uh, but, but yeah, is that why you changed your Twitter handle to Mr. Jake Parker? Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, Mr. Jake Parker. Yeah, that was, I just wanted to be a part of the Real Names Club. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, we'll talk more about, uh, well, okay, well, I'll just give you give your credentials real quick before I introduce okay. Gail, uh, our special guest today. Um, let's see, The Astonishing Secret of Awesome Man, which we just saw. Then also, if anybody has not heard of these books yet, what is wrong with you? Uh, I get asked all the time by people, what are good uh, all-ages books to recommend to you know, a young person or somebody who's young at heart? Well, for crying out loud, Missile Mouse Volume 1, The Star Crusher. Missile right. Mouse. Oh, look at this. Missile Mouse Volume 2, Rescue on Tankium 3. Yep. And then also you were in Flight Explorer. Yes, Flight Explorer as well. And uh, a couple of uh, the flight books also. So, the, yeah. Uh, the regular flight books as well. So, so, yeah. so what people should do if they want to find uh, good comics for their school library or for their young person in their life, they should just Google Jake Parker. There you go. Yeah. I, I would recommend it. A, a veritable font, uh, font, font, <laughs> fountain of, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Font works for me. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very vari variable Helvetica of, of uh, comic, <laughs> all ages comics. Uh, so to my right, we have an in-studio guest again. And, uh, you know, I've made it abundantly clear online uh, that one of my personal goals in life is to do my little tiny bit to make Ann Arbor a place where cartoonists want to live. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we've got our first expat moved to Ann Arbor because of uh, all the cool comic stuff that's going on here. Just say that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't move here for any other reason except that you heard that there's a vibrant comic scene here. Uh, Gail Williams of patbird.gailsor.com. G-A-L-E-SAR, as in dinosaur. That's right. Now, what is this comic? Um, this is a goofy auto bio slice of life kind of deal, and I'm coming in. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, um, 
in which my alter ego is a dinosaur and my boyfriend is a bird and we have excellent adventures. <laughs> yeah, and you've been chronicling some of your adventures in Ann Arbor since moving here. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So uh, getting lost because... So lost. Yeah, man, like I was biking back from downtown and then I just turned the wrong way and I was on Eisenhower Parkway all of a sudden and an hour later I was home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's you like, Gail, I was racing you home. What happened? Well. <laughs> <laughs> and and we should say that the the art style for this is super cute and accessible. Anybody who has a fondness for Pokémon or anything of that ilk would probably enjoy looking at your stuff. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And uh and it's very funny. I mean, it's not the kind of auto bio stuff where it's like I went to the coffee shop and I was mad and I punched the table at the end, right? <laughs> it has like kind of like a vibrant cheerfulness to it. Yeah. yeah like it, yeah. But uh you're starting a storyline now. Yeah, a very short one. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it was two pages in as of the time of this recording. That's some, right. some, some weird guys in suits just busted into your apartment. Yeah, basically. Like, hey, your story isn't good for anyone. It's not sexy. It's not action. What are you doing? We're going to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> Next page is up tomorrow. So, oh, awesome. So there you go. Scoop, everybody. Patbird.gailsword.com. New page tomorrow, well, which would be Thursday, the uh, 6th of October. Yes, sir. Uh, people in the chat are already chiming in. Love your comment. Gail just found out about it. So Thanks, there we guys. go. Yeah, everybody should be reading it. It's really, really cool. And there's really uh, uh, adorable and well-designed characters, which is something we're going to talk about today uh, when we get to the main body of the show. I want to zip back over to, oh, you're also um, Kelverin on, on Twitter. Twitter. That's right. Uh, Too many names. Where, where, where does that come from? Um, it's funny, actually. Um, one of my Thai relatives um, had a friend who needed a pen pal, which became me. My full name is Galadriel Warren, and somehow that merged into Kelverin when she wrote to me. Like, oh, wow. I like that. Thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, so Kelverin on the on the Twitter's uh, K, K, K. Man, I can't talk <laughs> K -E today. K e l v a r i n. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You can also Google Gail Williams. It's easy. Oh, and then uh, oh, Mary, Maribel Melonbelly in the chat is saying Gail's comics are great. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I wonder who that is. Um, <laughs> so zipping back over to Jake, uh, this is October. Yes, and it is. What happened? Huh? And if you know about October, it's also Inktober. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Is that where you're going with this? That's it. <laughs> okay. You, you, you <laughs> caught my softball. <laughs> so what is, what, is, what is Inktober? So, okay, the genesis of Inktober started uh, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, basically, I was trying to get back into inking and using a brush and, and using a brush pen and, and just wanted to train myself to be better at it. And so I challenged myself to do uh, a month-long uh, drawing a day thing and post it on my blog. And, and day one, I just said, hey, today's Inktober. Um, and uh, to celebrate, I'll be posting an ink drawing a day. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was a good exercise for me because I got better at inking and more comfortable with the brush. And, um, and I ended up putting out a little book, sold that. Uh, it, was, it was just a collection of all the ink drawings, and um, last year I, I did a couple of ink drawings, but October was a busy month for me, so I, I didn't do it, but I wanted to do it again this month, and so this month I'm doing it again, I'm doing an ink drawing a day, but uh, I figured I wanted to have more of a narrative to the artwork, not just random drawings, so I'm, I'm telling a story. I'll show you, I got some of the drawings right here, um, and so I'm using... I'm using brush pen. I'm using a brush and ink as well to do some of the big, big dark spots. For, for those who are listening in the audio afterwards, this the story so far is this fox-like creature who's breaking into a museum in the middle of the night. Yes. Now hold on, back up, back up. <laughs> I want to see this one with the with the the cityscape again with the yeah. front of the museum. Now you're doing this without throwing any pencil lines down. Is that is that right? No, I do throw. Oh, thank down. God. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm penciling at first. Um, you know, when I was doing the original Inktober, I tried to keep penciling to a limited, lim you know, just limit it, and I would just block in basic shapes because I really wanted the exploration to be done with with the pen and in the inking. Uh, and so that's that's how I did it there. And but this time, I just want to do good pictures, so uh, I'm doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm penciling these out first. I'm, okay. I'm using a red pencil and, and 
and fleshing it out and then inking over the top of that. Uh, quick quick uh, tool nerd question. Uh, why not blue pencil? Why do you like why are you using red instead of blue? Uh, my friend Willie Real turned me on to that. That's what he was using. He was using a, a red or it was like a vermilion, the actual color. And uh, I was using blue pencil up to then. I said, why do you use red? And he said, oh, I got bar- bored with blue. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I started using red. Oh. <laughs> I know some people will, like, use both. They'll use blue for, like, their initial blocking and roughing out a character, mm-hmm. and then they'll go in with, like, a little bit more refined detail with red and then go in with graphite afterwards. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I just like the red because it does give it a nice – it does – I don't know. It kind of sits back a little more, I think, for me than the blue does. Hmm. But um, I don't know. Teach his own. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's no right or wrong tool. It's just it's, right. it's always interesting. Not having used red pencil, it was something I was curious about. Um, people are asking in the chat, uh, what kind of paper are you inking on for this? Is that uh, so? I found I liked I had I found this laser printer paper that was just out of the copy machine at the place I worked. And I was like, oh, this stuff takes ink really well. I wonder if they sell a cardstock version. So I went down to the p- paper store, the you know the outfits for printers, right? And I said, do you have this 11 by 17 in cardstock? And they said, yeah, here you go. 250 sheets, it's 30 bucks. And I said, thank you. And that's what I use. I drew all of Missile Mouse on, those, on that paper. I've been doing Inktober on it. Um, wow. It, that's awesome. It, it holds, it's cheap and it holds the ink pretty well it's it's a little it's probably not quite as thick as bristol but uh i like it it's really smooth and uh the ink just glides on really well so if you can find out later on what brand that paper is and and let me know so i can put it in the show notes that would be awesome because i'll be interested in looking into that you know i guess another thing that is like what one of the things i do with my pencils is i'll actually pencil and graphite and then print it off in non-photo blue on my inkjet so i can so i have like a backup in case i screw up the inks yeah um, but Strathmore 300 series does not go through an inkjet very well for me anyway, mm-hmm. and I've heard from other people as well. So I ha- have had to get uh, Utrecht Bristol, which is the it's the th- it's the same. It's supposed to be the same quality, but it's like slightly thinner. It's just a little bit thinner than traditional 300 series Bristol, and then that makes it go through the printer just great. It still takes ink great, but if something's already pre-cut, and at, what is that? That's less than 10 cents a sheet. Yeah, it's it makes total sense, and uh, it it goes through the printer great. You know, it's for laser printers. So if you have, you know, if you have one of those at work, you can uh, you can use it there, and it works fine in my inkjet printer too. So, see, free tip. There's my little secret. <laughs> free free tip from Jake Parker, Agent44.com, New York Times bestselling illustrator. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's more to this guy than just great illustrations. So, uh, but anyway, Inktober. So you know, you you wound up getting a following on this thing. People are, are participating on it now. Yeah, people are participating on it. Uh, you do a, a Google search for Inktober, and uh, you get all all sorts of uh, things popping up. Um, so yeah, you know, I uh, that's great if people people do it. I just you know I want people to to get more comfortable with drawing and mm-hmm. using ink. Uh, it's it's like the the most basic form of illustration is just white and black and uh, and making uh, pretty marks on a piece of paper. So and 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 especially things like the brush, which terrifies certain people, like this kid here who only learned to like the brush about a year and a half ago. You know, I was I was totally a curl cool guy, and I fought people on it. You're like, I'll, you'll yeah. never get me to ink with a brush. And then I started inking with the uh, Pentel color brush pen. Mm-hmm. And yeah. fell in love with it, but uh, but yeah, but you know the other thing about ink is that it's permanent. It's not like because like Gail, you work a lot on you you you, you draw with light most of the time, right? Or or uh, when you with for your comic, your web comic, don't you? Um, I'm sorry. Clarify light. Well, yeah, on, on your tablet, your fancy future yeah, window. Yeah, my, my <laughs> magic drawing with you. light. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be poetic. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> 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 oh, I failed. But anyway, yeah. So, so you work on the Cintiq, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, but you do. I mean, you obviously, I'm sure you'd work on paper too, right? Mm-hmm. But do you do much inking? I mean, yeah. Um, for that, I've been trying to teach myself how to use the brush. Actually, it's really exciting. Which ones are you using? Um, Windsor and Newton Sable, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like the size one or something. Ah, uh, uh, oh, really? Size? That's tiny, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's exciting. What what are you using, Jake? What 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 are your preferred inking tools for Inktober? Just just so um, we can finish out the the, the tool tip or the tool yeah. recommendations. Okay, so I've got this guy. It's the Series Seven um, Windsor Newton Sable. So I wonder if that's the same thing. Yeah, it might just be. 
Yeah, so I use that. Uh, I have a thicker one to block in the um, to block in the the big big shapes, and then I, I have this Pentel um, this guy right here. Which, oh, the color brush, oh, yes. That, yeah, that's yeah. the one I was talking about. That's an awesome, awesome brush pen. It works really good. And then this guy, I, it, I think it's called the Zebra something over here. But if you if you do a search on my website for Inktober tools, um, I was turned on to this by another friend. He's like, oh, you want the best brush pen? It's this, um, I don't know if it's Japanese or Chinese or something. I think it's Japanese <laughs> pen, but I can't even read it. Whoa. Um, so if you guys can read that, there you go. But I think if, <laughs> If you type it in to my website, um, it'll have a, 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 the exact name for it, and then you can do a search on it. And these actually were shipped to me from Hong Kong. So Are they, are they refillable or are they no, temporary? No, that's, that's a bad thing. They're not refillable. Okay. But okay. Uh, they're beautiful. They, they do a beautiful line. They've got uh, a long tip right here and then a short tip oh, neat. for detail work and stuff. Okay. Super neat. Okay, yeah. cool. So oh, here, here's my red pencil. <laughs> oh, you use the old-fashioned yeah. the ones you have to sharpen. Yes. That means you actually have a sharpener in your house. Uh, I actually use an X-Acto blade. Oh, did, wow! Oh, Look cool. at you, You're like the Grizzly Adams of comics. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I'm, I'm totally addicted to my mechanical pencils. I can never go with you know the old Ticonderogas. Um, I'm such a wimp when it comes to that. Well, I got to sharpen it. Uh, uh, so, okay, well, let's talk about, uh, so everybody should just go Google Inktober and people should take on the challenge, right? Um, because you'll, you'll find that just in the, the process of, of having fun with ink and not being too precious about it, you're going to find you're going to sell inking better and having yeah. something to show for it afterwards, at least have a gallery of images. But I, I do like, I want to underline one thing that you did that I think is really cool, Jake. It's the idea of getting double duty out of it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to challenge myself to draw every day, but let's also try to make this something that I can also collect as something. Right, right. Th that yeah. can take the shows or put on my website for sale or something like that. Yeah, uh, not not to be all crass e economics about it, but it's just it it helps sort of it plays a psychological trick on you, doesn't it? To like keep you motivated to keep doing it because now you've got mm -hmm. these trophies of your past victories, right? Yeah, exactly. And and the original artwork too, I plan on selling as well. So if people are interested in that, agent44.com. <laughs> <There you> <laughs> so no, I want to add too, just about yeah. October, like. I choose to celebrate it by doing a drawing a day, but you don't have to take on that challenge. You could say, I'm just going to do a drawing every other day. I'm going to do, you know, one ink drawing a week. It does, you don't have to like do the full nine yards. Just, just get out there and draw and, uh, and, and do, you know, challenge yourself to do something that you can manage, you know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it does come down to that too. Is you don't have to jump right into the triathlon, right? It's right. like you should <laughs> figure out what is actually manageable because nothing's worse than taking on a. It's like when people talk about dieting and stuff like that, right? Uh, it's like you yeah. take on like, oh, I'm going to lose forty pounds this week, and then you don't, and then you feel worse, and right. it's very yeah. similar in, in psychology, right? So, um, so okay, well, you know, let's talk about character design a little bit because here's another thing that's going on next month, is. Uh, Let's see, 30 characters in 30 days. Uh, Tyler James puts together this, this challenge, another challenge, where he opens it up to the public to say, hey, everybody, try to design a new character every day for 30 days over the course of the month of November. Not an easy task, right? That sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, see, the, <laughs> that's, that's what we creative just... types always say. It's, you know, it's like, <laughs> it sounds hard. That sounds fun. Um, but yeah, that's at, that's at 30characters.com, and uh, so I figured a lot of people are going to be thinking about this in the weeks to come. Like, what, how do, how do you, what, what are strategies for designing a character? Now, I, I, I've got some notes that I put together on, like, ways I think about this, but mm -hmm. what I'm really curious about will, will probably be way more natural and more interesting is just to hear you guys kind of, like, just spitball what is your process if you can, like, try to draw a line around it. I'm sure it's not a ABC kind of thing. But if you could try to summarize, like, what is your, your thinking strategy? Like, how, how think of like a character you've designed, and what was the process of getting to that character? Do you want to go first, Jake? Uh, yeah, I'll go first uh, if if you want. Uh, let, one thing I like to show, and let me bring up the um, the folder here. Um, let me see if I can find this really quick. Is it's sort of the the history of Missile Mouse, right? He's uh, he's this character that I created for for the graphic novel, and um, and I originally came up with him 
when I was, I think, 14 or 15 years old. Um, and uh, um, I th let me see. I got it right here. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. So I was 14 or 15 years old, and um, what I did was I liked The Rocketeer. It was a movie that just came out. I liked um, uh, Spaceman Spiff, which was Calvin... <laughs> Calvin's alter ego in, in, in Calvin Hobbes. And I loved um, uh, Rescue Rangers, the little rodents. They'd put together stuff and, and go on these adventures. And I thought, why not combine all these into something, you know, something really cool? So what I came up with was, was Missile Mouse. And, and I just like drawing, drawing it because it was all stuff that I like to draw. I'm going to switch screens here so you can see. Um, we'll see if this works. Show display one. Is that working? Yep, I'm looking at it now. Okay, so this is this is like the original Missile Mouse drawing that I did back in 1992, I think it says there, and and uh, you can see he's got some of the proportions as Calvin sort of does. I mean, Bill Watterson's a huge influence in me, so so uh, so that's that's what's going in there, and he's got the Rocketeer um, fin on the back of his head, and. Uh, but as I continue to grow as an artist and as my influences changed, so did the character change. Um, here's actually the first comic I did. This, this was for my school newspaper. Uh, and you could see I, I was now inking him, and I was defining the line work a little bit better. Hey, Jake, can you yeah. zoom in any tighter on this? Because it's, it's, it's clear, but it's kind of small. I'm wondering if you zoom in on the presentation. Oh, man. Whoa. Yeah, there we go. That's awesome. That good? Yeah, that's great. All right. So yeah, there you can see uh, add. Uh, oh, now we're losing his audio. Oh, no. <laughs> you there, Jake? <clears throat> we can see it, but now we can't hear you. Game oh, over Skype. Game, game over, Skype. Game over. Yeah, we <laughs> lost Jake. Well. Hey, <laughs> hey, Gail. <laughs> it's me and you now. Uh, so maybe while we try to get him back, um, we can. Well, let me just try to get him back, and then, then we can turn to you. No, oh, it says it's offline. Let's try to get him back on. No, looks like it looks like his Skype crashed. Yeah, the drawings killed Ooh. Skype. Whoa, it killed my Skype. Oh, oh my. Wow, that's some that's good looking. Power, powerful illustrations. Jake Park, <laughs> everybody, Agent44.com, New York Times bestselling illustrator. Let's try this again. So, just when it was getting great. So, uh, no, no, he's still offline. Okay, well, while we wait for Jake to get back online, uh, you know, I was going to ask you anyway. Right. Okay. Like, so, like, let's let's talk about your your process. Uh, is it you know just try to do a, a quick Gale, uh, quick like walk around of what is a rough idea of what you're thinking about when you're designing a character. Um, hmm. it depends on if I'm like designing a character for a story or just for fun. Like a lot of the time, if I'm just like, hey, I want to design a character, then I'll start with like maybe a small idea or something I want to explore. Like um, this character I was working on recently, I really want to draw some guy with gauges. I have never done that before. A guy with what? Like gauges, those huge ear hole piercing things. Oh, is that what those are called? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I was like, but but what if his ear holes were like an AM FM radio? What if they could like sense crazy emotions? And I like went and spiraled off into a story from there. A bunch of what ifs. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's healthy. Oh, let me, uh, let's see if we get Jake back. Jake, you there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> see me. Sorry about that. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, well, well, I don't know if it was your Skype or mine because mine crashed right after uh, we lost uh, you. I, I don't know. Maybe Missile Mouse was too much for it. That's, that's what everybody <laughs> in the chat said. If the drawings were too beautiful and it killed the Skype. <laughs> <laughs> How far did we get? We got to the point when we were looking at the comic strip of the dinosaur and Missile Mouse, one of mm -hmm. the first comic strips you ever did. Okay, great. All right. So, well, does Gail want to finish? Where yeah, she's let's at? yeah, let's finish. Oh. Gail, yeah, let's finish what you were talking about, and then we'll zip back to Jake's presentation. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess yeah, a bunch of what ifs like just come out of that little idea, and then I try to, I guess like, 
make the character look like their personality, kind of? What does that mean? What do you mean by that when you say, like, make somebody look like their personality? Um, like, for example, if I wanted a person who was grumpy and old, like, maybe it'd be funny if they weren't actually old and they didn't look grumpy, but they acted that way. And then you'd have the whole posture thing going on to show that. Okay. So, so for, you start with like like body, ge like gesture sketches of your characters, like not gesture sketches in the traditional art school term, but I mean like <laughs> like the, like a body language kind of gesture thing, like where you're, you're having them gesture and their yeah, key yeah. emotion kind of idea. I feel like if you put something you're working on into a situation, it kind of brings the character out a bit more. Oh, that's good. Putting it into a situation, elaborate on that because I want to. That that's a really cool idea. It's like take the character and put them nice. someplace, right? Yeah, yeah. So like. How would they act in a coffee shop ordering coffee? Or how would they react to this ridiculous person approaching them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? You start playing, just, you just, you're playing pretend like you do in the playground, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, like, what if they were here? What would they say? What would they do? Yeah, Starting to would they be that. the kid destroying the sandcastle? You yeah. jerk. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, this is something I've, I've said time and time again to like my students is like, and people who get really stymied on this idea of how do you write characters. I'm like, well, what did you do when you were in fifth grade and you're on the playground and you were saying like, I'm the monkey with the rubber leash, you know, I'm, I'm running around and you're the, you're the guy who has to try to hold me back with the rubber leash. Uh, that's just pretending and that's all you're really doing, right? Mm -hmm. When you start. Like, do you find that it's, you said that there's a difference between when you're doing it for fun and when you're doing it for like a, a project. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there's like a different mindset like a different level of elasticity and um, the what ifs i guess so yeah because then i'm like trying to fit a character into a story and make it work like unless you're doing an alien story maybe i can't make this character an alien does that make sense yeah <laughs> yeah kind of yeah yeah um i don't remember where i was gonna go with that i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, I just, I, yeah, I just had a, a blank moment as I was, I was paying attention to the chat when I should, I should be uh, attending to what what's being said here. So, but, but yeah, you know, like the, sometimes I think that just having that kind of doodling kind of thing mm -hmm. can be in, 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 more inspiration than like I got to have five by five in the morning, you yeah, know, yeah. five designs on the desk kind of idea. Because um, the for me anyway, is like getting into like a sense of not really thinking about anybody else's ideas, where these ideas are coming from, but just letting the ideas happen rather than when you're thinking about a book or a project or anticipating an audience, it starts mm -hmm. to get scary. It starts to like get choke up on it. Does that happen to you? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Like, um, tiny blank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm terrible. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we, we, yeah. can, uh, we can lob it back over to Jake. And then we will uh, respond as we can, and then when the inspiration strikes you again, then we'll jump back on it. So that's, that's the cool thing about a conversation is you can yeah. pitch back and forth. So, <laughs> Jake, let, let's go back to you, Jake. What, what, what do you What do you got? All right. Did you want me to finish that Miss Mouse thing? Yeah. Going on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me try to do display two here again. Show that display. You let me know if it's working. It's working, but if you could zoom in. It's, yeah, we'll zoom in. Yep. So we saw this one. We'll move to the next one. So this was done the year later, right? And uh, as my influences changed and my tastes changed, I got a little bit older, Missile Mouse changed. So he became longer, uh, more human real, uh, proportions, right? Um, and then we'll go to this guy. This is when I discovered uh, Masamun Shira, who does... Uh, Apple seed, ghost in the shell. And you could see I really let him start to influence uh, not only character proportions, but technology and, and how I treat you know little details like zippers and Velcro. And, and it's really got me to start think through the, uh, the, the, the technical side of these things. And you could see, you know, I was also into all the image books, Jim Lee and, and uh, Dave Johnson and those guys. And so this was definitely... Uh, influenced by that. Um, yeah, I see pouches. Yeah, pouches. <laughs> yep. uh, in this comic, so this is me taking that character and then simplifying him again. So he's getting a little more simplified so he can go back to uh, uh, something that would actually be manageable in a, in a comic. Um, and then something interesting happened in about 2000. I had sort of this change of of, of uh, 
pace to my life. You know, I was a little bit more mature and I wanted to create something a little bit more for, for kids, right? So, and, and I remember seeing uh, uh, Stuart Little. You remember that movie that came oh, yeah. out? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, let's apply that to Missile Mouse. Let's make him cuter. And so this, this sort of happened. Um, and that evolved into this. He's really tiny there, but we'll zoom in. Uh, this is when I started learning Photoshop, and I wanted to refine the character and turn him into something a little bit more appealing and something that sort of bridged both the cute and something that was uh, a little more dynamic, right? Um, so I think we're about 2003 now, and you can see he evolved into this. I'm still figuring out some face stuff and some gear stuff. I should say, for, again, for people who are listening after the fact or just listening to the audio podcast, we just switched from a, like you described Stuart Little, like a very painterly kind of look to more of a cel-shaded look with like really dynamic ink lines, right? Like open contour line style, but with like really dynamic lines filled with very bold, crisp, uh, cel-shaded style, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You could see here really simplifying him even more. I'm, I'm kind of really grasping, trying to find how I want this character to look. And again, he's always sort of been on, on the back burner. It was something that I would draw when I didn't want to draw other stuff. You know, this was this character that's been with me for for uh, for years. And, you know, I, 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 it was sort of an exercise for me to, um, to see where I could take him next. Um, Here's this one. This one actually I drew about the time my wife was pregnant with our first child. And I want to say that somewhat influenced the drawing. Here. <laughs> We're looking at a robot with a whose head is a jar with a evil fetus inside of it. <laughs> Who has Missile Mouse in, in shackles. <laughs> no. People really should watch the video uh, instead of listening to the audio, whatever Jake's on, because he's always got such great visual examples. But that is... <laughs> How can so, something be cute and disturbing at the same time? You figured it out. I figured it out, yes. Well... <laughs> Actually, that's a good good point about character design too. It's um, uh, round rounder shapes are going to call to mind softer, cuter things. So if you if you want to do round shapes, you're going to make something that's more approachable. It's you know you look at a baby, they don't have a sharp thing on them, right? Yeah. But then you you juxtapose the roundness, like in this thing, with something sinister and technical, and you get that you get that uh, that sort of double. Uh, uh, kind of, uh, what would you say? It's cute and menacing at the same time. Cute but deadly. So, <laughs> cute but deadly, right. So that fed into this, which was pretty much where Missile Mouse is at now. Um, this is, you know, I, I sharpened up some areas. He's not as soft in places. And this led into uh, this design, which is... Uh, is is pretty much final. It's 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 the missile mouse that that made it into the graphic novels, and so that's the fifteen, almost twenty year history. <laughs> actually, yeah, in twenty twelve, it'll be the twenty year history of the design of missile mouse. It shouldn't take you that long to design a character normally, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, there you have it. And that, that actually leads me to um, the three most important things that you want to do in character design. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this and I actually want to show you, let me see if we're still on here. Uh, Jake, am I there? Yeah, you're here. Oh, okay. I want to show you a couple books that if you really want to learn character design, you should probably have these in your library. And first and foremost is Cartoon Animation. This is by Preston, Preston Blair. And it is um, just the beginning basic stuff. It's He's teaching animation principles in here. He's teaching good structure. Uh, the designs are dated, but they're solid. And you can apply the things that he's teaching here, like on this page, you can apply <laughs> these things to whatever kind of style you're doing, whether you're doing anime, whether you're doing more traditional comic book style. Um, all this stuff works. And I think uh, this is John Kay, John Christopher Lucci, the guy that did uh, Ren and Stippy. Mm. Uh, you know, he said, you don't need to go to four years of animation school. You just need to buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I may have butchered his quote, but, but it's, it's a really good book. Uh, again, the designs are dated, 
so don't go look at it for design ideas, but look at it for principles that you want to apply to your designs. Uh, if you want something a little more um, contemporary, there's Ben Caldwell, and he's got action cartooning, and he followed it up with fantasy cartooning. And these are great, good, solid books on just learning the basics of uh, character design. And he goes in and, you know, Ben's a phenomenal artist in his own right, and he breaks down just how he does it here and, you know, shows you different head styles. Oh, um, yeah. Shows you what makes a good young character, what makes a good old character. The various degrees of exaggeration, too, going from, like, yeah. like a Bruce Tim kind of animated-looking style to something a little bit more classic Disney-looking. and yeah. Yes. So this is good good stuff, and he does the same thing in fantasy. It's just more geared towards monsters and and mythological type of things. So cool. that's a book. And then lastly, uh, Tom Bancroft puts out a book called Creating Characters with Personality. And he's a Disney animator, and this has some really good fundamental stuff in it as well. Um, he talks about shapes and how you know to build your characters. Um, the main thing, the main problem I see with the students that I teach and just um, uh, amateur character design out there that I see on the web, the main problem I see is people have a hard time with the, the basic construction of a character. They might have a cool idea for a character, but the character isn't solid. He's mushy. Um, and the way I liken it to is if you build a house, you're, you're not going to put shingles and drywall up first. You're going to first build the framework. You're going to get the two by fours and you're going to set up the shape of this house. Then you're going to do all that cosmetic stuff at last. And what I see too often is people worrying about cosmetics first yeah. and they're doing it on top of just poor, poor design. So um, I'll go back to the, the screen share here and talk about um, this, is, this is sort of the lecture that, that, I, that I teach. We'll see if these are big enough for you guys to to look at. Okay. So I'll zoom into these. There we go. Yeah. Three basic shapes, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so triangle, circle, and a square. Triangle, circle, and a square. And there's three basic things you want to remember when designing a character. And I get I get these things from the, the book, Creating Characters with Personality. Uh, he really breaks it down easy. And it's stuff that you might already know, but it's it's good to just go over again. But three, three main things you want to remember. You want to remember shape, size, and variance. The variance between the shapes and the variance between the size. And that's what's going to make your character um, uh, set, you know, set it apart from, from other characters. But you have these three basic shapes, triangle, circle, and square, and every character is made up of these three basic shapes. If you know how to draw a square, circle, and triangle, you're going to be able to start, you know, drawing characters, uh, no problem. But it's how you put these shapes together and what these shapes mean. Uh, so we, we look at one of the most iconic characters ever, and what is he? He is a square, right? Right. Yeah, Basically, SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> It's in his name. He's a square. So that's using that basic shape. And, that, and, and you want to think about sometimes if you're doing a simple character or, or, or really stylized character, the closer you get to these basic shapes, the more stylized your character is going to be. And I bring up Powerpuff you know, Girls, yeah. the most stylized characters ever created, right? Uh, they're basically these these shapes, these circles, these triangles, and these squares. They don't even you have fingers, and they work that into the story, where they actually <laughs> refer to the fact that they don't even have fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. That's awesome. But there you go. You got, you got those basic shapes. And because, um, because they're sticking close to those basic shapes, the characters are going to be much more simple. And, and, uh, and, and they, they register instantly, too, right? They do. Yeah. Now you can make up a comp you can have a complex character, but you know I look at Jafar for an example. He uh, he's a complex character, but he's still made up of these basic shapes. And here he is broken down, like he's mostly these triangles, uh, and it's it's offset by this nice circle circle on the top of his head to kind of balance the thing out. So he's made up of triangles. Powerpuff Girls are these giant circles with appendages. Uh, SpongeBob is a square with with appendages. The mm -hmm. thing with Jafar is you even look at his face. 
you know, we'll zoom in here. His face is triangles as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> When you break it down, like, oh, people need to be watching this video. Yeah, like the basic shape of his head is a triangle pointing down. And then from his grimace to his nose is a triangle pointing up. And then there's a counter triangle in his eyebrows pointing down at his nose. So, yeah. Yeah. And even his eyes, I mean, they're like these half circles, but they're, they're triangular half circles, right? Yeah. So, so that, that are these, these are these basic shapes that you, and these relationships that you want to be thinking about as you're designing a character. And, of course, certain shapes also represent um, certain personalities as well. And this is a scan from, from that book that I, I held up, uh, personal, uh, Creating Characters with Personality. And here what, what, uh, what Tom did was he, he got rid of all the extraneous details, um, all the aesthetics, you know the, the 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 shingles and the siding and and the paint and he just left us with the two by fours and we get a pretty good idea about what these characters are uh you use these big round shapes and you're getting you're getting a softer more doofus kind of character you're using big square blocky shapes and you're getting um you know a firm stalwart you know viking type character you look at the the vikings and how to train your dragon they're all just these big squares right right and Squares usually suggest something firm and immovable. Uh, you think of a brick, you think of a big, um, you know, a, a big boulder or something. They're they're chiseled and 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 they're rocky, and and that is what you associate with with those with that with that shape. You look at your circles. What are what are circular shape? Puppies, kittens, um, baby seals, human babies. <laughs> right. And the more you use circular, round, soft shapes. The more soft and, and, and approachable and, and, and cute your character are going to be, and then look into nature uh, with your triangular shapes and, and what's the most fearsome, ferocious character nature you know uh, animal nature has ever created. It's it's the great white shark, and it, all it is is triangles from its teeth to the fins to the overall shape is a long pointy triangle, and so we associate you know these these, these psychological uh, baggage that comes with these shapes, and when you apply them to your characters, you don't even have to add. Um, uh, eyes and noses and, and fingers just by their basic shape you get what that character is what their personality is and then when you start to mix that up when you start putting sharps with softs you get these more complex characters and and uh, you know I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit um, here we have you guys still seeing these images? Yeah, okay? yeah. It's okay, good. we have Dinosaur Bob, right? He's a dinosaur. Dinosaurs are usually these big, ferocious things. But William Joyce wants to make Dinosaur Bob uh, approachable. So what kind of shapes does he use? They're all circles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I did a little draw over here. He's just these big, round, fun, circular shapes. Um, here's one of my drawings, CC and Benson. Um, and... I wanted these guys to be cute and fun and approachable, so I used these circular, round, soft shapes. Um, Can you go back just one? Because I want to I talk about that just for a second. There's like a yeah. sense of imbalance in the bear there, right? He's, he's bigger on the top than he is mm -hmm. on the bottom. Uh, what does that convey to the, to the, the reader? Because to me, it, it, mean, it seems like a little bit off balance, a little bit kind of silly and cute. Uh, well, that, that's, that's part two, right? Yeah. Part one is coming up with the shape. Part two is size, and then part three is the variance that you have in those sizes. So I have my round shape, and I have a large circle, and I have these smaller circles that make up, you know, the ears and the bottom thing, uh, the bottom part of them. And then variance is where you get you you move from what's expected and what's typical to something that's that's maybe unexpected and more and more appealing. So. That's why you know I, I made this offset, off-centered, heavy, top-heavy bear is is to just have something more, more appealing and 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 unexpected. Um, let me bump ahead to. Uh, yeah, because we're actually getting low on time, so okay. and we might need to skip ahead to variants. So where are we where are we now? I just want to show you um, this guy from from up. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's Carl, and. The way they describe him here, they say Carl is a box, a heavy brick, because of how close to the ground he has sunk. After the death of his wife, he has shut off the world around him. 
So he's stuck in his ways, very square, impenetrable, unmovable. There's heaviness to his soul. It's easy to read that he's been going through a lot. And what shapes does, do they use to, to convey that? He's all made up of squares, right? Yeah. You go to uh, the kid that they pair him with, and what's he made out of? He's a big circle. He's an egg shape. And, and it's by putting this egg shape with this square and this soft personality with this hard personality where you start to get the dynamics. You go to Ellie. She's, uh, she's this tapered form. She's round at the top, but she's tapered. And usually when you taper things, it represents something that's more um, uh, uh, light on its toes and more... Um, uh, uh, sprightly, you, maybe? Sprightly, <laughs> maybe even aggressive, right? Yeah, yeah. Think about the dogs in the movie. Uh, you've got Doug. What is named Doug, right? The, the, I think so. Yeah, yeah. The, the good dog. Compare, yeah. So you compare his shape to the bad dogs. They're all squares and triangles, and he's this round, soft thing. So that's that's basically uh, using shape. And the, and the most interesting thing about Up, and this is this is genius on their part. When we meet Carl Muntz, or not not Muntz, uh, Seymour Muntz. What's his name? Oh, the character that Christopher Plummer played, <laughs> the bad yeah. guy. Yeah. He, when we meet him, he is this heroic shape. He's he's tapered. He's got these round things, and that's when we first see him. And then when we actually see him, and he's the bad guy, he is made up of all these triangles. He's got a sharp, pointy nose. His fingers are triangular. His the shape of his head is more. You know, his jaw is more uh, sharp and pointy. Uh, his ears are a little bit more pointy, and that's to just visually back up that this character has gone through a change, that he's he's turned evil. And so uh, the last thing here I'll show you is, is you've got your shape. You know, it's the snowman thing. You put these things uh, in, in the predictable order, and it's boring. It's what you expect. But if you just mix it up, you maybe you put the small shape in the middle, and you put the largest shapes on the on the outside. That's where variance comes in, and that's where you get your characters to be a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more um, uh, maybe even expressive and, and and appealing. So that's that's uh, that's character design for me in a nutshell. The basics that you you just have to be thinking about uh, when you go into this thing. That is awesome. That was a super, super, that was basically like a free class that you just gave us, Jake. That yeah. was super, <laughs> super cool. Uh, no, what I love about that too is that this is something that I, you know, I've been drawing for a long time and I'm constantly being reminded of this whole idea of shape and variance and, and really seeing my characters in that kind of wireframe mode before dressing them up in anything. Uh, and I've been doing the series of um, reimagining the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe characters on my website, just as like a, a it's a playful thing that I do, just like you know, yeah. keep my mind fresh. And they're great too. I, I've been enjoying them. Oh, thanks. Hey, do you hear that, everybody? New York Times bestselling <laughs> illustrator said they're good. You should go to comicsgreat.com/blog and you can see them. <laughs> <laughs> No, but but one of the things I did with the He-Man one that really surprised me was is I was just being playful and I made his uh, bicep area very thin and his forearms very big. And I was really, I mean, I was probably thinking of Popeye. <laughs> but when I did that and I had him standing arms akimbo, it just looked really cool and really fresh to me all of a sudden. And, and, and people remarked on it like, oh, it looks really weird having his bicep so small but his forearms so big. But that's that change up that kind of g gave mm -hmm. like a freshness to the design that I didn't expect at the time. And I wound up using that on a lot of designs after that. So just, yeah, flipping around around those those shape expectations uh, and what I love about this just to put it like a like a black crayon underline under, underneath everything you said is what you're talking about is an intentionality in design over illustration skill perhaps mm -hmm. I mean illustration skill matters and right. but that's something you will acquire but right. even if your illustration st skill level isn't that good an intentionality about how you combine these shapes and, and arrange them will take you pretty far right Oh yeah, yeah. You can have uh, you know poorly rendered character, but yet you know if he's if he's got solid design principles, uh, he's going to be much more appealing than than anything that's over rendered or, or, or you know detailed. Yeah, man. We are running up against the clock, and there is so much more to talk about. I wish we had like two, two or more hours to do, to, to cover all this stuff. Because I, I mean, we didn't even scrape the edge of the notes I had on here. I had like starting with the idea, you know, like do you start with a meta idea, what the characters are doing the story, inner life? Do you start with the inner life of your character? Do you start with the premise, what function the characters are to serve in the story, like what what's their situation? Like you were talking about earlier, Gail. 
uh, starting with the image, like that's what we were talking about, like starting with shape, uh, color, body type, uh, costume, species, like anything that we could. So there's a lot I had spitball that I wanted to cover, but I guess we'll just have to do a follow up. We'll do parts two, three, and four, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll turn this into a, yeah, a lecture series, and then uh, Jake will start his speaking tour. Uh, <laughs> Do a, do a TED uh, Talk. Well, sorry if I took... Uh, no. That was really cool. Thanks. No. Are you kidding me? That was amazing. People are saying in the chat this is one of the best episodes ever. So, no. Mission accomplished. Uh, that was... That was yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so, final thoughts. I want to give everybody a chance. Final thoughts. What's what's one thing, one pet peeve about character design that you could share, perhaps? Like, one thing, just, just to commiserate with everybody else who's going to be struggling through 30 characters in 30 days, or 30characters.com. What, what's one thing like, oh, dude, I've been there. Yeah, what's the thing that you would share? Um, I guess for me, like, the details should help make the character, like, adding buckles for no reason isn't always helpful, especially since I studied animation. It's like, simpler is better, let's go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you guys know the story about the Millennium Falcon being built on the set of Star Wars, and there was that model that was set up in one of the front offices that people were just invited to stick tchotchkes on. Have you guys heard this story? I didn't know. Tell it to me. This may not be true, but I remember hearing this a long time ago, that supposedly when the Millennium Falcon was being designed, they wanted that kind of guts-out approach of having it look kind of junky and lived in. So they had a model set up outside in one of the front offices at the studios, and they just invited people as they were passing by, take little bits of model pieces and just glue them wherever on this thing to, like, give this thing kind of a rusty, worn-in look. Well, meanwhile, while this was happening, there were dudes in this back room who were building the full-size set for the, the, the Stormtrooper fight scene. And finally they had to put a note on it that said, please don't stick any more things on there. Every little tiny one inch thing you stick on there is two weeks of work for us. <laughs> and I think about that like in all my projects, like keep it simple because every little thing you add in this fun little sketch, it's, you have to draw this how many times in a comic yeah. series, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, keeping it fun to draw, mm -hmm. right? Because, like, that's another thing. It's like if you're doing a 25 to even a 200-page graphic novel, how many... Right? Like, that's if you look, lines. look at Look at Pat Bird and Gail Sor, right? Like, very simple, mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're very distinct, too, is that uh, actually going back to what Jake was talking about, <laughs> like, Pat has is very round, mm -hmm. Gail very pointy, <laughs> Pat has those big round eyes, so he can always do that thing where he's looking up and rolling his eyes, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and, and Gail has these little tiny dot eyes and with the, the, the big mouth, the yay! Like and, dumb excitement, like yay! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, but also very simple, so it's repeatable and recognizable. Something Dave Roman said, Dave Roman of VATime.com, uh, he, he, he's posted on my Google Plus because I put out a call for topic ideas. Uh, or for like follow-up question ideas based on the topic. And he said that one of the things that he wished he would, well, I, maybe I shouldn't paraphrase, maybe I should just read it, so otherwise Dave's going to get me. <laughs> uh, so one, the one le lesson I wish I learned earlier and could retroactively address in all my comics, make sure your characters have distinct, unique enough clothing, costumes, visual tags so that someone could easily cosplay as the oh. character and stand out as, in fact, being a character rather than just some random person wearing a sweatshirt <laughs> <Yes>. and jeans. <laughs> And I think about all, like a bunch of my characters in the front. Yeah, they're all wearing people clothes. <laughs> you can't be any of my people because it's just the guy in a tie. That sucks. So there's something to think about too. I didn't even think about that, like cosplay. You know, if you want like your stuff to catch on with an audience, you want a fandom to interact. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you could dress up as Gail Sar easy. Big paper mache <laughs> orange head, right? Yeah, yeah. I should do that in the winter though. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway um final thoughts jake any any final like commiserations uh no i you know just look for that uh that one trait for your character something that's unique and identifiable uh big big part of good character design is is a strong silhouette and and uh you could black out any of any of the major characters from spongebob to mickey mouse to bart simpson and the ears on mickey you know, you, you see that, you know, when you go shopping at the grocery store, when, when a couple of cans sit together, you know, you're like, oh, there's Mickey. Yeah. That's how strong a character design he is. Uh, and Bart Simpson, you know, you, you look at the edge of a paper bag and you, you immediately recall his hair, right? You know, uh, the, 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 the serrated edges there. So anything you can do to, to really give your character something unique, that unique trait that will help, uh, help them be identifiable it's, is, is, uh, is really good. So. 
Well, awesome. Well, we, we're going to have to bring this roundtable back again for a follow-up on this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a break from from talking about this stuff, Jake, but, uh, but right. I, I will be bugging you again. And, Gail, there's people in the chat saying that they want you back, too, so you're going to have Thanks, to come guys. back. And, and you're right in town, so... <laughs> Yeah, it was I nice would love to. Meet you. It was great meeting you. So, okay, uh, Jake Parker, Agent44.com. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jake Parker on Twitter. Yep. Uh, you're on Google Plus. You're on. You're yeah. on all the social things. Uh, and then everybody should go out and get the Astonishing Secret of Awesome Man. Mm -hmm. uh, help keep it on the list. Keep it on the bestseller list. For yeah, let's, let's get three weeks in a row. That'd be good. Nice. That would be cool. And, and hey, you know what? It's it's a good looking book. So I don't think anybody's gonna regret purchasing it. So. No, oh, you're you're gonna want it on your bookshelf. Yeah, especially if you got a young person in your life. So, or, or if you're just like a big kid like me. So, uh, any any other things you wanted to plug while you're here? Uh, no, just follow uh, Inktober this month, and you know yeah. it's gonna be some good illustrations going up, and uh, and uh, keep an eye out for that. See how the story pans out. So, cool. Yeah, it's looking really, really good. So, and then you can watch on the site to purchase the original art afterwards. Uh, so, okay, Gail. Thank you so Thank much for you. being here. It's been a pleasure, guys. So where, where, where are you? You're at uh, patbird.gailsar.com. That's right. Gail, G-A-L-E, then Sar as in dinosaur. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's following your misadventures through life, through your avatars. That's right? right, yeah. It's exceedingly funny and cute. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would, you know, put it in the same family as like Nemu Nemu, you know, like if you enjoy Nemu Nemu, you'd enjoy patbird.gailsar.com, I think. Making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> Kelverin on Twitter. That's right. And you got a public Twitter, right? I mean, that's yeah, not, that's yeah. not private. I, I, I couldn't remember and didn't want to throw it out there and like everybody's going to be sending you requests. Uh, you're on I the like Google. friends. <laughs> you're on the Google Plus too and all Google those Plus. places. Anything you wanted to throw out a mention for? Oh, blank. Oh, Just not good. the storyline? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a storyline going on, so you yes, got to go back a few pages to get caught up. Mm -hmm. uh, so cool. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, Eli Nyberger is going to come in here with a few book recommendations, so we're going to switch your seat real quick, right. Gail. So Jake, I'll let you go then. So thanks Bye. again for being Bye. with thanks us. Again. And uh, yeah, we'll, it's we'll my talk pleasure. Soon. Thanks for having me on. So long. Bye. Bye. So, and here comes here comes Eli Nyberger of the Ann Arbor District Library. How's it going? Good. You? I'm oh, doing well. You know, we don't even have to wear these anymore because Jake's gone. Oh, okay. Jake is gone. <laughs> All right. But I don't feel like a podcaster. I know. I, I know. I know. Oh, yeah. now, now we're legit. All, All right. right. So, uh, okay. What, what's going? Uh, how's the new game going? On oh, the it's going crazy. The Boolean key just dropped this past week. Treasure Quest. So uh, that was over the weekend. The second key dropped. Uh, it requires uh, some pretty advanced decryption skills and three people have already cleared the boolean gate so they found the boolean key and they found the boolean gate and they put those two together and so wow. yeah, people are really getting into it weren't you dropping some of the keys like really late at night on twitter on yeah the, well yeah. you know i mean it's like i say that they come out on the first of the month which usually means by midnight on the first of the month so <laughs> i'm gonna try to do a little bit better with that oh I, th forward. I thought that was part of the game though it was like well you gotta watch the twitter you well, never certainly, know you know that that's an unintentional benefit of the uh, <laughs> of the method. It's really just that I never quite get it all in the right place, uh, right okay. at the right point. Because it's fun to try to you know write a puzzle that's challenging but solvable for such a wide range of people. I mean, we've got six and seven year olds playing the game, and we also have forty and fifty year olds playing it. So yeah. it's uh, it's an interesting mix of audiences to to put together. Oh yeah, I can imagine that's a pretty big challenge. Yeah. Play .aadl. Play .aadl org, and you can oh. see right there the Boolean key. And actually, it involves comics. So, uh, oh, sweet. Yeah, so we'll see what we can do. Okay. So I did bring a couple things um, just to kind of show off. Um, so, you know, talking about uh, my kids are, are big fans of Missile Mouse and Flight Explorer is such a cool series. And uh, yeah. they've just been reading through Copper, you know, uh, Kazu Kibushi's uh, kids book from Scholastic. So I grabbed a couple things out of the youth section. Um, this first one is Peanut Butter and Jeremy's Best Book Ever, which is one of James Kachalka's stuff. And, and uh, you know, I think... Uh, James Kachalka has gotten a lot of commercial success with his kids' stuff, Johnny Boo, uh, Pinky and Stinky. Yeah. Um, they're really great stuff, and this is definitely something that is very much Kachalka quality, as he calls it, which <laughs> is, um, you know, it's adorable, really cute characters, un, you know, very sort of real dialogue, but also kind of has like this slacker aesthetic, you know, yeah. like in like the film where nothing really happens. I've read this book. Know? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's really, you know, basically the, the, the bird, Jeremy, wants to steal Peanut Butter's hat. <laughs> is And that's 
the conflict. Yeah. Um, and but it just it's really great. It's so cute, and my kids really enjoyed it. And the cat wants to pretend that he works at an office. Yeah. So there's some very good stuff in there, and you know, uh, I think he's someone who particularly without adapting his style at all writes for a lot of different audiences. You know? Absolutely. I Absolutely. mean, uh, his his comic, uh, you know, his daily journal comic, American Elf, is very much not for everyone. It, it oscillates know. between being embarrassingly sincere and forthright to being scatological. Right. To, right. Yeah, it's all over the place. And yeah, like I would not recommend those those comics to kids, but yes, but then he does stuff like this. And right. it's totally appropriate to kids and anybody who just enjoys his stuff in general. Yeah, so, so this, this is highly recommended. I love this book and uh, it's great for kids of all ages. And then also on the sort of webcomic people doing work, this is Tony Millionaire's Little and Large. Uh, you know, he had an amazing strip. I don't know if you say Makis or Makis. Uh, you know, M-A-A-K-I-E-S, yeah. which ran for years. Uh, it used to run in Salon is how, how many years that's been around. And um, he just – this kind of has two parallel stories going on at the same time, one on the left side of the page and one on the right side of the page. Yeah. So it's very interesting stuff. You know, it's his big character, Sock Monkey, who is kind of uh, – you know, also has his alter ego, Uncle Gabby, in the other comic who's a drunkard and Sock Monkey isn't quite the same of drunkard. So again, he's working on multiple levels. If you appreciate his characters, you get a lot more out of it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's also a very accessible short little kids book that only, you know, only by word balloons is a comic as opposed to a picture book. Right. You know, so there's a lot of, uh, I love this book and he's just got great line quality, all that stuff. But this is something that I hope yeah. everyone is aware of. And yeah. I know you probably are, Jersey, but man, this is Meanwhile by Jason Shiga. And this is one of the most impressive achievements of plotting that I have ever seen. You can print. get lost in this book. Yeah. 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 I mean, literally lost in this yeah, book. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. and then it's like, and there are, it's so it's basically, it's like a choose your own adventure, of course, you know, and there's the, the interface is really intuitive, which is a funny thing to say about a book, but you know, for, whoops, sorry, Sergeant Slaughter, I knocked him off there. Um, but for, you know, any one of these things, you just follow the line from the box that you choose. And the first choice is chocolate or vanilla. And you just follow the line to the tab and then you turn to that tab and then you pick the tab back up. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he made this work in this book with one cohesive set of plots is just unbelievable. And there's a particular page here because there's some places in here that you have to cheat to get to that don't have a – but like this is the nexus of the book <laughs> where, I mean, every single one of the possible tabs goes out to a different point. It kind of randomly drops you into other points in the story. Wow. It's just mind-numbing. And it's – and the interesting thing about this is, you know, it starts off chocolate or vanilla is your first choice. It's very kid accessible, but this is a dark story. Yeah. I mean, it is really dark. You know, one of the devices that he can play with uh, is called the Killatron. And if you push the button, it kills everybody outside it. And they use that to prune entropy off of the causality tree. All this kind of stuff. It's just, I, I mean. That's stuff I, I was thinking about when I was in fifth grade for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, exactly. And it's like, uh, you know. Adults, you know, if you're in comics, you should really, really read this if you haven't, just because it's such an amazing achievement. I need started to... out as a web product, and then he t turned it into a book. He, he, uh, if I remember right, he if doesn't have it. I thought he had some kind of background in mathematics, and he has a fascination with making puzzles. Yeah. So there's the there's the confluence of that kind of background with visual storytelling. Right. It's it is a really interesting book, even if you're just looking at it from a theoretical standpoint of what can you do yeah. with comics. Yeah, I, I I really need to approach. Well, it and in some show. ways, you know, it's like he's the only person who's kind of taken up Scott McCloud's mantle yeah. of of what you can actually do. And and I mean, this is like web stuff in print. Yeah. You know, so he's really taken the uh, the possibilities of comics to new levels. And I just got one more thing, which is probably not as well known as it should be. And this is from Factoid Books. These were series they did in the 90s. It's called The Big Book of X. And there's a bunch of different ones. This is The Big Book of Hoaxes. There's The Big Book of Scams. There's The Big Book of Crime. Okay. We put these in our teen section because these are all true stories. They're pretty dark. Most of them are one or two pages drawn by a – written and drawn by a bunch of different comics luminaries. And just to kind of uh, – Let's see, skip over the bibliography. Let's see, you got writers. Um, here's uh, Carl Safakis was a crime reporter, Steve Vance. Uh, most of these people are journalists as opposed to comic writers. But I'm seeing Joe Sacco in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, again, Rick Geary drew a couple of these. Um, Peter Cooper. Um, you know, Stephen Lieber. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots oh, of... Oh, Steve Lee Aloha. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah. Okay. You said this is from the 90s? Yeah, this is from 1996. Okay. Can, yeah. I, can I just do a plug for ADL and libraries in general? 
uh, go to a comic store and try to find this. They yeah. don't carry back issues anymore. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you can get these books at your library for yeah. crying out loud. So there we go. Uh, but anyway, go, finish your thought. Well, well, I was just saying that you know there are a lot of really great stories that people don't know enough about in here. Uh, for example, there was one I was just looking at earlier. Let me see if I can find it. Um, what was his name? It was this doc, a fertility doctor who basically used his own sperm and all of the women that he helped to wound up having babies that are look a little bit like him. Oh, God. Uh, is really like, like, oh, my God, what is wrong with this guy? But <laughs> it's a true story. And uh, it's just all these different scams. And for me, uh, reading through this, I was like, oh, here's entirely new worlds of skepticism I wasn't <laughs> previously <laughs> exposed to. Um, but there's just, yeah, it. I love this series so much. Big Book of Scams is just fantastic. And uh, it's and there's also Big Book of Scandal, which is very helpful for finding out about kind of the reality behind scandals that you only know by name from before your birth, like, you know, Teapot Dome or, you know, uh, oh, wow. that kind of stuff. Or even for kids today to find out the risk upon Watergate, you know, oh, yeah. those kinds yeah. of things. There's all, and I just, I can't get enough of nonfiction comics. There's so much great stuff out there. And it's just, you know, it's such a fantastic way to subsume that information because it really sticks. Well, and as we were talking about with Jake, I mean, the line quality and the shapes and the style that you apply contribute a, an enormous amount to storytelling. So, like, when you look at that, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I saw um, Dave Gibbons' artwork in yeah. there, and Dave Gibbons has a very crisp, straightforward style, but then yeah. Steve Lealoha is very expressive and very animated. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a... That's, I mean, anybody listening to the show is already going to get excited about it because it's in comics format. But for those of you who are listening who are not practitioners, <laughs> who are, who may be librarians, uh, yes, this is one of the reasons that these books are so exciting is that it, it gives you a visceral kind of level of storytelling that you can't get from the printed word. Yeah. So. And it doesn't shy away from some pretty, I mean, it talks about the protocols of the elders of Zion and it talks about Hughes and his, you know, Howard Hughes and his jars of urine in his fridge and you know, oh, wow. all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, cool. yeah, highly recommended. So that's the big book of X by Factoid Books. There's a bunch of different ones out there and hopefully your library has them. And if not, then you can always use interlibrary loan right. or any kind of like uh, borrowing system that exists in your state, in the, at least in the United States. I don't know what happens in Canada. Do they have something similar to that? I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, speaking of library, I've got some uh, calendar announcement pieces to go out here. Anybody who's in the local area listening, October 16th, the Ann Arbor District Library will be hosting the Comics Artist Forum follow-up from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Downtown Computer Lab. Uh, open lab time with uh, Macintosh computers with Photoshop elements installed. I'm going to be there to help walk you through doing a digital cleanup and coloring. Uh, come on, that's a pretty awesome thing. They have free access to Photoshop elements and on nice Macs. That's pretty cool. And then October 18th, we're going to have the Kids Make Comics panel from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at Mallet's Creek, and we're going to record that as an episode of Comics Are Great. We're going to have some young people from the area who participate in a lot of the different events and workshops talk about their experiences and what it's like being somebody under the age of 18 making comics. So uh, those will be in the show notes and on the calendar at comicsaregreat.com. Uh, one last thing I wanted to shout out for since we were talking about uh, it being October and everything. Uh, a friend of mine, Barry Gregory, is doing a, well, his wife is actually spearheading a, kicks, a Kickstarter for a horror anthology called Dark Mischief. And just do, go to Kickstarter and do a search for Dark Mischief. That'll be linked in the show notes, too. Uh, I think at the time of this recording, there's like 20-something days left. But yeah, a cool, neat horror anthology with a lot of really awesome cartoonists in it. Danny Jones, Sarah Turner, Mark Rudolph, a whole lot of really great cartoonists are in this thing, and it deserves support. So uh, that'll be in the show notes as well. So thank you, Eli. Oh, my pleasure, as thanks always. Thanks for the great uh, book recommendations. And hey, thanks for being on the show last week. That was a super awesome yeah, episode. Yeah, I had fun. Yeah, yeah that, that was, that, we got to do that again. We got to do more of those. So, okay, uh, where can people find you? I'm on the web at, at uh, I'm on Twitter at Ulotricus, U-L-O-T-R-I-C-H-O-U-S. Uh, I have a very sad blog at ulo.trico.us. And, uh, you know, but mostly uh, you can see what I'm up to at play.aadl.org. And there we go. So uh, thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening. Thanks to, thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting on this show. Until next time, next Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, where we'll be streaming at comicsgreat.tv. I've been Jersey Drozd of uh, comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.